Hello, today we're going to read chapter 11 in Because of Wind Dixie. And before I read, if I've taken a break, I always like to kind of look back and reread the last paragraph or so, or just skim it to remember what happened. So when I do that with chapter 10, I remember that at the end of chapter 10, uh, Opal had come home from her day at Gloria Dumps when she had shared everything um, with Gloria about her life. And she just told the preacher about how she met Otis, how she got the invitation from Sweetie Pie and about Gloria Dump and all her friends. And in the end, um, when Dixie looked like he was ready to jump up on her bed and the preacher knew it and said, go ahead, why, what are you waiting for? Just jump up. So now chapter 11, please open your books and read along with me. That night, there was a real bad thunderstorm. But what woke me up wasn't the thunder and lightning. It was Win dixie whining and butting his head against my bedroom door. Win dixie I said, what are you doing? He didn't pay any attention to me. He just kept beating his head against the door and whining and whimpering. And when I got out of bed and went over and put my head hand on his head, he was shaking and trembling so hard that it scared me. I knelt down and wrapped my arms around him but he didn't turn and look at me or smile or sneeze or wag his tail or do any normal kind of Win dixie thing. He just kept beating his head against the door and crying and shaking. You want the door open? I said, huh? Is that what you want? <clears throat> I stood up and opened the door and Win dixie flew through it like something big and ugly, mean, ugly and mean was chasing him. Did you hear that simile? He flew through it like something big and ugly and mean was chasing him. Win dixie I hissed, come back here. I didn't want him going and waking up the preacher. But it was too late. Win dixie was already at the other end of the trailer in the preacher's room. I could tell because there was a spring sound that must have come from Win dixie jumping up on the bed. Ooh, did you hear that figurative language? It was onomatopoeia, spring. And then there was a sound from the preacher like he was real surprised. But none of it lasted long because when Dixie came tearing back out of the preacher's room, panting and running like crazy, I tried to grab him, but he was going too fast. Opal, Opal, said the preacher. He was standing at the door to his bedroom and his hair was all kind of wild on top of his head. And he was looking around like he wasn't sure where he was. Opal, what's going on? I don't know, I told him. But just then there was a huge crack of thunder one so loud it shook the whole trailer and Win dixie came shooting back out of my room and went running right past me and I screamed, Daddy, watch out! But the preacher was still confused. He just stood there and Win dixie came barreling right toward him like he was a bowling ball and the preacher was the only pin left standing and wham! They both fell to the ground. The figurative language makes this writing so much more interesting. When it says Win dixie came barreling right toward him like he was a bowling ball, great example of a simile, and wham, onomatopoeia again, a sound word. Uh-oh, I said. Opal, said the preacher. He was lying on his stomach and Win dixie was sitting on top of him, panting and whining. Yes, sir, I said. Opal, the preacher said again. Yes, sir, I said louder. Do you know what a pathological fear is? No, sir, I told him. The preacher raised a hand. He rubbed his nose. Well, he said after a minute, it's a fear that goes way beyond normal fears. It's a fear you can't be talked out or reasoned out of. Just then, there was another crack of thunder and Wick Dixie rose straight up in the air like somebody had poked him with something hot. When he hit the floor, he started running. He ran back to my bedroom and I didn't even try to catch him. I just got out of his way. The preacher lay there on the ground, rubbing his nose. Finally, he sat up. He said, Opal, I believe when Dixie has a pathological fear of thunderstorms. And just when he finished his sentence, here came Win dixie again, running to save his life. I got the preacher up off the floor and out of the way just in time. There didn't seem to be a thing we could do for Win dixie to make him feel better. So we just sat there and watched him run back and forth, all terrorized and panting. And every time there was another crack of thunder, 
Winn-Dixie acted all over again like it was surely the end of the world. The storm won't last long, the preacher told me. When it's over, the real Winn-Dixie will come back. After a while, the storm did end. The rain stopped and there wasn't any more lightning. And finally, the last rumble of thunder went away and Winn-Dixie quit running back and forth and came over to where me and the preacher were sitting and cocked his head like he was saying, what in the world are you two doing out of bed in the middle of the night? And then he crept on the couch with us and in the funny, this funny way he was, where he gets on the couch an inch at a time, kind of sliding himself onto it, looking off in a different direction, like it's all happening by accident, like he doesn't intend to get on the couch, but all of a sudden, there he is. And so the three of us sat there. I rubbed Winn-Dixie's head and scratched him behind the ears the way he liked. And the preacher said, there are an awful lot of thunderstorms in Florida in the summertime. Yes, sir, I said. I was afraid that maybe he would say we couldn't keep a dog who went crazy with pathological fear every time there was a crack of thunder. We'll have to keep an eye on him, the preacher said. He put his arm around Winn-Dixie. We'll have to make sure he doesn't get out during a storm. He might run away. We have to make sure we keep him safe. Yes, sir, I said again. All of a sudden, it was hard for me to talk. I loved the preacher so much. I loved him because he loved Winn-Dixie. I loved him because he was going to forgive Winn-Dixie for being afraid. But most of all, I loved him for putting his arm around Winn-Dixie like that, like he was already trying to keep him safe. What a great chapter for Opal and the preacher and Winn-Dixie. And boy, the author, Kate DiCamillo, used so much figurative language. There was even more that I didn't mention that she used to describe Winn-Dixie running around. Did you notice it? If you want, go back. I'm gonna go back with my notes and make some notes so we can talk about this figurative language another time. Next time we'll read chapter 12.